The title of my sermon this morning is Thankful for the Holy Spirit's Indwelling Presence. And I know that's a mouthful, but I didn't know really how to shorten it and get everything I wanted to say out. This morning we're going to be dealing with some very large theological terms, but I don't want that to turn you away. We have the term entire sanctification. Now, when I say that, most of us will go, what did you say? <laughs> Unless you're an older uh, Nazarene believer, you've probably not used that too many times. Maybe you've used something similar like perfect love or the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, being filled with the Holy Spirit, the second blessing, the second work of grace or Christian perfection. All of those are different terminologies to talk about the same thing. I don't want to go into all of the discussions and the arguments of how it happens, when it happens. Um, we're not going to do that today. I'm going to leave it plain and simple with no fusses and no fluff. Just give it for what it is. The infilling of the Holy Spirit, entire sanctification, is what took place in the upper room at Pentecost. Plain and simple at its base. Before Pentecost, the believers were a rough bunch. They were looking for themselves. They were prideful. They were fearful. They were up and down in their spiritual walk. I mean, Peter gives the greatest declaration of all of the Gospels. And then within a few moments, <laughs> Jesus says to him, get behind me, Satan. They, they were a rough neck, a bunch of boys. But after Pentecost, they were completely and totally changed. And what I want to talk about is that change this morning. Last week we were thankful for God's salvation of all of the mess that we had made of our lives. And the terrible decisions that we made, Christ paid for it all. He paid for more than we could have ever done. He did it so that it was gone. So that when he looks at us, he doesn't see us as sinners, but he sees us as saints. This morning, I want us to be thankful for the infilling of the Holy Spirit and sanctification. Because without it, our Christian walks would be up and down. <laughs> We'd be looking to please ourselves. We'd be, we'd be looking to get what we want out of life. Boy, would it be a mess. We wouldn't be changed. We wouldn't be made new. We'd be forgiven. But oh, the wreck we would make of our lives without the infilling of the Spirit. John Wesley said it this way. If we set the, the standard too high for the infilling of the Spirit, we'll drive men into hell. But if we set the standard too low, we'll let men drift into hell, and one's just as bad as the other. <laughs> I'm not going to give theological dis definitions, concepts this morning, other than the names that we have just listed. What I'm going to give you is my personal experience. I could give you all that John Wesley said in the 1700s, and you'd say, wow, he knows what he's talking about. I don't care if you know, if you think I know what I'm talking about. What I do care is you know that I've experienced what I'm talking about. And that's what I want to share with you this morning. The experience of being filled with the Spirit. Now, I also know that I'm not going to be able to give justice to all of the ways in which God has changed me. But for the time allotted, I want to give as many as I can. And I've left myself enough time, so I should be able to do so. But understand, this is not an exhaustive list. You can ask my wife. She's probably got one. 
but this is a list that the Lord brought to my mind, and I added the scriptures to back it. <laughs> Oops, you're not supposed to see my nose. Where'd I go? There? There. Woo! So I'm going to start this sermon the same way I started last week, talking about being thankful we're saved. I want you to ask yourself the question, have you ever or are you now in your spiritual walk in constant inner, inner turmoil? Is your spiritual walk a struggle on the inside? Are you struggling or have you struggled to understand the Bible? Are you on a spiritual roller coaster? You do really well, and then something comes along, and man, you, you just crash. Are you struggling with being loving, having joy, holding on through the hard times, being kind, doing the right thing, or being reliable? Have you ever spiritually been weak, having a lack of physical strength? Or maybe not being able to discern the situation you're in. Maybe you walk into a situation, you have no idea what's going on, and you don't know what to do. Or maybe you've walked into a situation like I do often as I get ready to preach and say, Okay, Lord, <laughs> what do you want me to say about this? Have you ever or are you now hurting, whether physically, spiritually, or emotionally. By an uplifted hand of yes, could it, would anybody be willing to admit that yes, they have in the past or they are now struggling with one of these issues? Thank goodness I'm not alone. <laughs> <laughs> I want to say in the forefront, this doesn't mean you're sinning. Maybe, maybe you are, and maybe that's the reason you're struggling with it, but it doesn't mean that you have to be. It also doesn't mean that you're not sanctified, that you're not filled with the Spirit. Maybe you're not, and maybe that's the problem, but it doesn't have to be. You know what your answer yes tell, should tell you? God has more for you today than what you had yesterday. Amen. And God's going to have more for you tomorrow than what he's got for you today. Amen. He's not done with you yet. Aren't you all glad that he's not done with your pastor yet? Boy, am I. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> God's, Christ's desire is to give us the same spirit that he had that we can have success in these areas. Right. Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1, it talks about Jesus as the rod from the stem of Jesse. And then it tells of the spirit that Jesus had. And it's the spirit of the Lord, L-O-R-D, Yahweh. And it shall rest upon him the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. When you get into John chapter 14, as the, as the disciples have been in the upper room and they're beginning, they're going to go and walk to the garden and Jesus is going to go to the garden, they said going to cross. Before that happens, he's trying to console his disciples and saying, yeah, I'm leaving, but I'm going to leave you a gift, a beautiful gift, something that's going to make you beautiful, that you can adorn yourself as, the, as my bride, and I'm going to come back and get you. And in John chapter 14, verses 15 through 31, Jesus talks about leaving us the Holy Spirit and gives all kinds, and I just didn't have time this morning to run through it. But then after his death and his resurrection, the disciples are all in a room. Jesus shows up, just boom, he's there, doesn't walk through the room. He just steps in the room. They're all scared. He says, oh, no, no, peace, guys. Have peace on you. And then he said, oh, excuse me, then he said, have peace on them. And he breathed on them, verse 22, and said, receive the Holy Spirit. And they probably hoped that he had brushed his teeth that morning. That was a joke. I'm sorry. It was a bad one. I know. <laughs> the same spirit that Jesus had, he wants you to have. It doesn't give 
provisos of those that can receive it and those that can't. In fact, he wants all of us, and we will deal with that passage, that says it's God's will. It's God's will that none should perish, right? We talked about that last week. It's also God's will that you be entirely sanctified, that you be filled with the Spirit. And we'll deal with that, but that's coming towards the end. So, I've, that's the introduction. The rest is what I have for you. My life. So what did the Holy Spirit filling me, what did it do for me? Well, first and foremost, it gave me peace. John chapter 14, verse 27, he said, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. The world's peace is one that it does its best to give you external peace. You put a roof over your head and walls around your house and windows. You put storm doors on so that when the storm comes, you're still on the inside in peace. But at best, the world's peace is one that only takes care of what's outside. Right. The peace that Jesus leaves with us when he gives us the Holy Spirit is one that it doesn't matter what's going on on the outside, but on the inside. Is where the peace is. And I'll tell you what, that's a whole lot better. <laughs> because in this world, you will have trouble, Jesus Amen. said. Yep. So you're going to face bad storms. And if the only peace you can have is on the outside, that means you're going to have some good times and you're going to have some bad. But you know what? If he gives you his peace on the inside, it doesn't matter what's going on around, you can always yeah, have right. Amen. peace Amen. in the midst of the storms. Amen. Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7, Paul says, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to, made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Colossians chapter 3, 15, he says, And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which also you were called in one body, and be thankful. Did you know that you can have victory over anxiety? It's not just a treatable dilemma. It's a fixable one. If I didn't believe that God could fix my anxiety, I wouldn't be a roofer today. I know I've told you the story before, but I was working in Lexington selling Kirby vacuum cleaners door to door. Not the best of jobs. Especially for a guy that's a terrible salesman. I was walking into trailer parks going door to door trying to sell a $3,000 vacuum when their cars weren't even worth that much at the time. I, now, don't get me wrong, I love a Kirby vacuum cleaner. I, I mean, if I could buy one, I would. Because I think they're the best. But I don't have one because I can't afford one. <laughs> And most of the people I was knocking on their doors couldn't afford one either. I was going hungry. And I said, God, you give me any job and I'll do it. So I started looking through the Lexington Herald, because they didn't have, you know, the online ads and all of that at the time. And the first thing I came to, it said, roofers needed. All you gotta do is pass a drug test. Well, I knew I could pass a drug test. I've never had I never had drugs then. I still have it today. So I thought, well, I know I can pass it, but I can't get on a ladder. I seriously, as an adult, shame as, as it is, I could not get more than three steps up on a, on a ladder, on a step ladder. I would shake. I was scared to death. And God said, that's the job I want you to go get. I said, no, well, okay. <laughs> he said, oh, yeah, it is. So sure enough, I went and looked at, uh, called up Burnett's roofing and uh, went for the interview, and sure enough, I got hired. And I did, I did, I didn't lie, but I didn't give the whole truth. I said heights make me nervous. 
I didn't tell him heights make me incapacitated. <laughs> I figured that might be a deal breaker when I get, went to get the online application, I mean the application. But they hired me, and I went down to Berea, and we were working on those old buildings down there in Berea, the 1800s buildings downtown. And I can take you to the place today, we had the ladder up against the roof, and I got halfway up the ladder, which is higher than I'd probably ever done. And I have the ladder that I'm building this. And I couldn't move. I was scared to death. And I stopped right there in the middle of it. I didn't care who was watching. First day of the job. I said, God, you gave me this job. I need the ability to do it. And I prayed and I said, Amen. That was all the prayer I had. And I did my best shaking as I climbed up that ladder and I got to the roof and I was at absolute peace and my fear was gone to this day. By later on in that week, you know those old 1800s buildings? I was hanging over the edge three stories up and I was reaching as far as I could with the hammer hitting nails in down below with no fear. It wasn't me. I couldn't have done it. But the Holy Spirit gave me peace. And I promise you, he can give it to you as well. Not only can he give you peace, he can cure your anxiety. Notice what he says here in Philippians chapter 4, verse, chapter 4, verse 7, and then also Colossians chapter 3. What he doesn't say is, and peace with God, which surpasses all understanding, and let the peace with God rule in your hearts. There are other passages that it talks about having peace with God. But that's not what he says here. He says the peace of God. There's a major difference there. When you're at war with God, you're not at peace with it. When you ask forgiveness of your sins, you become at peace with God. But that doesn't mean the battle's over. Maybe it means you surrender. <laughs> but there's still a big mess going on when there's a war around you. But the peace of God you see, that's the same peace that God has. Mm -hmm. uh, what scares God? Not a thing. What does God want you to be scared of? Not a thing. The peace of God. Rule in your hearts. Be king in your hearts. Because this is what you were called be part of one body. Understanding God's word. John chapter 16 verse 13, however, when he, the spirit of truth, the Holy Spirit has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will tell you the things to come. He will glorify me, and for he will take of what is mine and declare it to you. The Holy Spirit will guide you into all truth. Whatever he hears, he will speak to you. He will tell you the things to come. He will glorify Jesus. He will take what is Jesus and he will give it to you. I remember I was working on a sermon and it was here. Second year we were here. And I had two stories. And as I prepared the sermon... They were completely, they were related, but they made no sense together. At least that I saw. I worked on it, worked on it, worked on it. I tried to get rid of one of the stories, and the Holy Spirit checked me and says, no, I want that in the sermon. So then I tried to get rid of the other story, and the Holy Spirit checked me and says, no, that's going in the sermon. I said, but they don't make sense, Lord. He says, I want you to preach it anyway. And you know me, I mean, I preach from PowerPoint. I put all my notes on the slides so that I can see what I'm going to say, so I don't forget anything. I still do. But I was like, Lord, how am I going to do this? The message was Paul and Silas. And Paul and Silas were in prison. And God wanted me to tell that story about Paul and Silas being in prison. But he also wanted me to tell the story about why they were in prison. Because just before that, there was a woman that was filled with a demon. And they were walking, she was walking around being an annoyance and a, and a terror to Paul and Silas. So they cast her out. 
Well, the owners of the lady got mad and they had Paul and Silas thrown in jail. Those two stories, they made no sense to me whatsoever being together. But I said, all right, God, well, fine. If I look like an idiot, it's going to be your fault. <laughs> yes, that's how I talk to the Lord sometimes. <laughs> and I got up to preach, and I'm not kidding, it went this fast. I got up, and I stood in front of the computer, and the Holy Spirit dropped the bomb of exactly why he wanted me to tell those two stories. Because he wanted, to, he wanted Paul and Silas to see in a physical sense what had happened to that poor woman in a spiritual sense the day before. And I had never seen that. Even while I'd studied for six hours trying to get the sermon down. But he gave me exactly what I needed to understand his word. I can read, I can reread a passage, and the living word always speaks. And I don't know how many sermons I could preach on Psalm 23 alone. And honestly, there are pastors around this world that all they have is one page. And that's all they preach because that's all they have. But every time they do, the Lord gives them more. It's like no other book. And because it's like no other book, we need understanding like no other reader. And that's what the Holy Spirit gives Victory. Psalm 20, or excuse me, Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 23, is a whole passage talking about having victory over sin. Verses 1 through 2, he asks the question, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? His answer was certainly not. How can we who are dead to sin live in it any longer? And then verse 14, he says, for sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. John chapter 1, verse 6. For if we say that we have fellowship with him and we walk in darkness, we lie and we do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he's in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. And the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We are to have victory over sin. Our spiritual lives are not to be up and down, up and down, constant in a roller coaster. I could have went with an entire sermon just talking about spiritual victory here, but we don't have time for that. God designed it so that we don't have to sin. And as you are filled with the Holy Spirit of God... Just like in the other situations where you didn't have the ability to do it before, he gives you the ability to habitually live above willful sin. Right. You don't have to fall to sin any longer when the Holy Spirit is in your life and empowering you. If you're trying to do it alone, you're going to fail. You'll do good for a while and it'll pop back up again. It's true. But when you have the Holy Spirit on the inside of you, he gives you the ability that you can stop the sinning. You don't have to do it over and over again. If you're living less than that, I'm telling you this morning, God has more for you. He has more for you than you had yesterday, and he's going to have more for you tomorrow. I have found that my words, they got changed, <laughs> that I didn't think... I could change that vocabulary. Right. My lies, that was rather habitual. My evil thoughts that seemed to reign my human male body. My rage. I have found that the Holy Spirit gives victory over. Do I live up to that all the time? No, sometimes he does win. But you know what? When that happens, we have the Christian bar of soap right over here. For 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I have found in those times that I do fail have been less and less and less. And now that I look back, some of them are gone completely. And they were ones that I never thought could be gone. 
I remember hearing a story by Gary Chapman uh, much into his later years, and he talked about going to a hotel and going to a pool and seeing uh, some people that normally would have gave a different thought in his mind. And I'm keeping it as best to PG as I can. <laughs> and he said all of a sudden, he said it clicked with me. I had a different thought. The thought was that the persons that he saw coming in were children of God that he loved and that Gary Chapman now loved. And that what he was seeing was a broken life trying to get attention. And he was broken for that person. And he said, I wouldn't have had that thought yesterday. But something changed. It was the Holy Spirit. I have found that God has even changed my desires that I might have greater victory over sin and temptation. If you are living in the up and down fight for your spiritual walk, God has more for you than that. The Holy Spirit empowers you to live above sin. Period. Exclamation point. Anything less than that cheapens the blood of Jesus with every drop that you shed. If he didn't have the power to save you out of the sin, why would he put it in the scriptures? If he doesn't have the power to save you from the sin, why did he get on the cross in the first place? Right. He did it because God has the power for you to live above sin and temptation. But when you do mess up, he's also given the, the opportunity to wash up, dry off, and start over. My children get dirty all the time. Do I just let them stay in the dirt? No. We whip their butts until they get in the shower. They go and wash at least once a year. <laughs> and then we tell them, all right, go after it again. We don't have to live with the muck and the mire on us all the time. Amen. If we live that way, to be honest, do you, do you realize how little God can do in you when you keep fighting me? Right. Wow. <laughs> I want to give you this. I want to do this for you. I want to do this in you. Bring it over here, buddy. I got all this stuff that I want to keep, and you're not getting it. Because mm -hmm. you ain't going to be much victory in that war. Right. He's going to say, fine. Have it as you wish. Right. The next thing is the fruit of the Spirit. Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 and 23, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Did you know that you can be loving in all situations? Do you know that you can have joy in the midst of trouble? That you can hold on through great trials? We just went through the... Um, the week that we prayed for the persecuted church. And last year we watched the video, the movie, and it talks about one man, um, the title is Tortured for Christ, but he was taken and, and he was strapped so that his feet were bare and up and every day the man would beat him relentlessly. Every day. That was how that woke him up. And for a long time he was angry and he was mad at God. God, even though he was faithful as this was facing him. And over time, he began to where he was even able to forgive the man while he was beating his feet to make it so that he could not ever walk right again. You can hold on through the greatest of trials. You can be kind in every single circumstance. You can do the right thing even if it's hard. That's what goodness is. You can be trusted and reliable. That one I'm still working on. <laughs> Not all the fruit right, is right there, you know what I mean? <laughs> Some of it's growing, but it doesn't mean it's ready to eat. The longer you walk with the Holy Spirit in your life, this starts coming out of it. If you don't have love, Check with the Holy Spirit and say, hey, why not? 
And maybe it's because he ain't answering. Because he ain't there. Or maybe it says, well, you've been holding on to these things. And I can't put love in you when this is all over here. The Holy Spirit gives us the ability to be loving in every circumstance. We should be living loving. Romans chapter 5, verse 1. Therefore, having been justified by faith, like we talked about last week, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we also have access by faith into his, this grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only that, but we also glory in our tribulations and our troubles, knowing that the tribulation produces perseverance. You can have glory in the terrible things that you go through because you know on the other end of it, you're going to grow up with patience, something you probably never want to have to pray for. You'll also get character, and character leads to hope. And hope doesn't disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who is given to us. That's probably one of the greatest things that the Lord has given to me through the Holy Spirit. I was a selfish, self-centered, self-focused, self-pleasuring I was. And I'll be honest, when I got saved, some of that changed, but not a lot of it. But when I was filled with the Spirit, perfect love entered my heart that was never there before. And it wasn't a love for me. It was a love for others. Even in my last pastor, I think my greatest downfall was thinking for the longest time that being a pastor was the job that you did to teach and to preach the gospel that people might find salvation. But that doesn't mean I have to love the people. And as I sat underneath my grandparents in their ministry, I saw the love of God poured out in their hearts for those that were in the church and out of it. It changed me. By the way, we often think that the opposite of love is what? That's not what the Bible teaches. Look what the Bible says. Love has been perfected among in, in this, that we may have boldness on the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love. They are antithetical. Perfect love casts out fear, because fear involves torment. But he who fears has not been made in perfect love. Are you fearful? You know what the Holy Spirit can do in you? He can put love in there and fear has to leave. You know what? If the person that I'm speaking to knows that I love them, I can say things a lot more harsh. But if they don't know that I love them, you have to walk on eggshells, don't you? Perfect love casts out fear. If you don't know this, you wouldn't recognize it now, but I was and probably still am on occasion a very, very shy man. When I was a boy, I was extremely shy. There's lots of reasons for that, and I'm not going to go into those pains. But I will say this, I am not the man I was. I would walk into a room and go and hide. I remember at my last church, first Sunday we were there, they were having a meal. We had left West Tennessee, we moved to East Tennessee, and I walk in the room and they were having a meal and the place was packed and it was we were late but because of traffic in Nashville. And so they had already started the meal without us and it was to invite us there. Just sign that, kids weren't born yet. And I walk in and I see all these people that I've never met in my life, but two, my grand, my set of grandparents, and that's it. And I am absolutely scared to death. So bad scared that they have one of those uh, gas brick wall units. They've got a little tab that sits out 
and I'm walking by it, hiding, and I catch my pant leg on it, and it tears my pant leg down to my knee. I came back after I changed my pants. Everybody, of course, felt sorry for me that I just ripped my new pants, but I went and changed my pants. I came in for five minutes and ate and said, okay, well, I gotta go unpack. And the truth, and that was a blatant lie, the truth was I was so embarrassed and scared to talk to anybody. I was shaking and I couldn't do it. Perfect love casts out fear. When you receive the fullness of the Holy Spirit, He puts perfect love in your life. He also gives you power. Acts 1.8, that you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all of Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. God gives us the power to have boldness, even if you are shy, <laughs> when you never thought you could get past your show. It's true. He also gives you discernment. I remember I preached one Sunday, and there was a person that was there that I could tell was deeply moved in my last church. And they came to my house afterwards to eat, eat supper with us. And the Holy Spirit said, I need you to go talk to that person and just tell them that I love them. That was it. I was like, I'm not one of those guys that says, okay, this is a word from God for you. That's not me. <laughs> but the Holy Spirit kept nudging me, so I pulled the person off to the side and said, God told me to just tell you this, that you are loved. Person broke down sobbing and said, Oh, not with all that I've done. God gave me no other information than just to say that. And you know what the next response was? I don't know what you've done. I don't know all that you have done. But I know this. Whatever it is, it wasn't enough because He told me to tell you that He loves you. The Lord can give us discernment. We had no information. I also remember in my last church, there was a lady that called me in a panic and said that her boyfriend was threatening her with a taser. I had no idea what happened, so I get armed to the teeth. I call the police, and I tell the police that I'm going to meet them over there because I'm going to try and save her life. Come to find out, it was her birthday. She was drunk, and he wasn't threatening her with a taser at all except to protect himself. Yeah, that went really well. So I take her out of the home, and I don't know where to take her, because she's single. She's drunk. I thought, well, I mean, I guess at some point, I got just, I, I can't take her home. And the Holy Spirit told me to go to Waffle House. So I took her to Waffle House and had her drink at least two pots of coffee. All the while, she's telling me in her inebriated state, oh, thank you, I appreciate it, I appreciate it. A week before she goes to leave, she sends me a message that tells me that I was her undying love. And it was at that point when I realized that the Holy Spirit had put up a huge wall when I took her to Waffle House that saved my marriage and my children. Lord, can give you the sermon. The Lord can give you physical strength and give you the ability to do things that you were never capable of doing before. Look at Samson. He was carried off the walls. He can also give you impromptu words. Words that are perfect for that moment. And I don't know how many times the Lord has said through someone else, oh, that was exactly what I needed. Oh, it wasn't me. The words that came out of my mouth were only I by the Holy Spirit to say that. I had no idea that was going on in your life. The Holy Spirit can give you impromptu words. And lastly, the Holy Spirit can give you healing. Luke chapter 4, verses 18 through 19. And the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, Jesus said, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted and to proclaim liberty to the captives, to recover the sight of the blind and set liberty of those who who are oppressed to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. I want you to know this morning that your brokenness is healable. You don't have to be a victim another day. The wound 
means that no one else can touch Jesus can. I had a deep personal wound that led me down a path of confusion, selfishness, hatred. There's a lot of people that have had that same wound. They haven't found the healing that I found. And I didn't find it in books and talking to someone. That's not where I found it. I found it in the Holy Spirit speaking to me. The Holy Spirit can touch the deepest wound. It was Jesus' job to come and heal the brokenhearted and to release. Whether it's emotional healing, physical healing, or spiritual healing, nothing is beyond his ability and power to mend. But I'll be honest, there's many people that won't let him do it. There's many people that would say, Pastor, oh yeah, let him come and let him heal and let, let him do all that. Let him empower me. Let him give me information. Give me discernment. But they're not willing to do what it takes to have it. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 19 says, Don't quench the Spirit. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30 says, Don't grieve the Holy Spirit. And we do those things by our actions or our inactions. We also do it, in it, do it by keeping back from God. Say I'm going to sell you my house. You like my house up there in Overly Wells. And you want to buy it. We get down to the details of signing the paperwork. And there's some fine print at the end. That says, I'm going to sell you all of the property. I'm going to sell you the entire house. All of the basement. But I get to keep the living room. I get to redecorate whenever I want. I get to remodel whenever I want. I get to paint what I want. I get to put in there what I want. I get to be there when I want. Would you sign that agreement? No. Because you wouldn't own the house. You'd own most of it. You'd almost own all of it. But that one section would be enough that you couldn't do anything in it. I'm colorblind. Whatever I put on the walls might not even match what you like. But that's exactly what Christians do on a daily basis with the actions and inactions of their life. They say, God, I'll give you this, I'll give you that, I'll give you this, I'll give you that, but I'm keeping this. And God doesn't work that way. He can't remodel the house if you still live there and want control of it. The only way God can remodel your heart is if you give it to him and let him have it. As a new owner, he is happy to rearrange. And make the most beautiful home you'd ever see. But you simply have to trust him. You have to trust him with the things that you may lose. You have to trust him with the things that you had hoped would come. You have to trust him with the things you were scared never would come. You gotta trust him with all of it. You turn the keys over and you say, Lord, do a good job. And then you leave it up to him. I, uh, I was watching a movie last night. By the way, if you've never seen the movie Mully, you should. But in this movie, there's a man, and he's got an orphanage, and he's trying to take care of a bunch of children, and there's no water. It's in the desert, and the children, one of the children, one of the children dies, and he doesn't know what to do. He keeps praying, keeps praying, keeps praying. They try to drill wells. They, they go and spend a ton of money to drill wells 200 feet in the ground, and they can't find water anywhere on the property. And they have 
I think it was somewhere around a thousand children in this orphanage. So him and his wife are praying about it. And in the middle of the night, the Lord tells him to get up, take his wife, and go pray. And the Lord told him to go straight outside the door and turn left when I tell you. <laughs> so he drags his wife out of bed. She said, I didn't know what was going on. <laughs> and he takes her. They go straight outside the door. They turn left. And they stand, hands in hand, and pray. And say, okay, okay God, is this where you want? And he said, it is. The next morning, he gets the orphans and his own sons and says, all right, go out and dig. And his own son admitted, he said, a bunch of us didn't want to do it because we just had these big machines and they couldn't find water. And now he's going to have us do it by hand? And they start digging 15, 20 feet. And they finally, they get all the way down to lava rock. And they can't dig anymore. And the man's own son said, we trusted you. And we put our backs to the work. And we found you he said, I don't know what to tell you. He said, but God told me to dig here. And the sun turned around one more hit of the max. And it wasn't just water trickling. They said water began to gush out of that rock. And I don't want to spoil the end of the documentary. But I'm just going to tell you what God did with that well is unheard of. trusted the Holy Spirit to tell him what to do, and he did it. And man, when he hears that song, Thank You in Heaven, you won't see most because there's going to be souls all around him. Would you stand with me? tell you this morning, and I tell you often, but it's the truth. I am so thankful I am not the man I once was. I am so thankful that the Holy Spirit can heal. The Holy Spirit can give victory. The Holy Spirit can give knowledge and discernment and power. Because if I did not have that, I would not be the man that I There's a lot of theological concepts I can throw your way. But this is the only one I want you to get today. 